Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to join us today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokom Limde. We're on DTT because we're free to wear. On DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 125, welcome to Joy News, your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. This afternoon, over $1 million stolen from Sanitation Minister Cecilia Dapas' home in Abelengwe. We have details of all that has happened. Also on the NPP presidential race, we'll take you to a tea region where Alan Tremontin engages some party delegates on his bid to lead the party into the 2024 elections. Plus this afternoon, there's a call for the issue of terrorism to be seen and dealt with as a societal advice separated from religion. We have details of why the negative impact of technology must be the focus rather than religion. We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Join News on TV. My personal handle is Adenana Aisha. Please stay for details. Two house helps of Cecilia Benada Pina, her husband Daniel Oseko for are before an Accra Secute Court for allegedly stealing monies and items running into millions of Ghana cities. The said monies were allegedly stolen from the couple's room in their house at Abelinkbe, a suburb of Accra in the Greater Accra region. 18-year-old Patience Boche and 30-year-old Sarah J allegedly stole the monies and personal effects of the couple between the months of July and October 2022. The first accused patients also has her current and former boyfriends, as well as her father, all being dragged before the same court. My colleague Joseph Akable joins us via Zoom with further details of the court case. First, who are these five individuals and are all of them in court because of stealing from the minister? Now, some of the minister, 18-year-old patients, portraying 30-year-old Sarah J. Then there's also patient's father, then a current and ex-boyfriend, Benjamin and Malik, and the father is Kweku Boche, who have also been arrested and charged. The claim of stealing is against the house helps, whereas the current ex-boyfriend and father are said to have received various amounts of money, hence the offense of dishonestly receiving has been leveled against them. Do, do we have a sense of how exactly these huge amounts were stolen? They were stolen from her room, which she shares with her husband in June this year, uh, the minister discovered that some items and money had been stolen to so report the matter to the police. A patient had earlier been found to have entered the room using a duplicate key. So once she was arrested and granted bail, and uh, because she was a nursing mother, she went into hiding. Together with her boyfriend, she rented a three-bedroom apartment at Tamale for more than a hundred thousand cities, as well as a store at a cost of hundred and twenty thousand cities. Uh, the police retrieved. $40,000 and more than 72,000 cities from her upon a second arrest. She's also alleged to have bought a house at a cost of $70,000 at Amrahia and furnished it with brand new items. She also bought a Hyundai Elantra for her boyfriend, then gave her ex-boyfriend an amount of 1 million cities and the father received 50,000 cities. Tell us about the other items that were uh, stolen. So there are clothes that were valued at 95,000 cities. In terms of jewelries, they've been valued at $95,000. There's also kente cloth worth about 90,000 cities and six sets of men's suits valued at $3,000, which are properties of the minister's husband. And what charges are the suspects facing? For the main individuals, the two households, the charges are stealing, whilst the other three individuals have been charged with dishonestly receiving. Mm. You, you talked about how one of them bought a house, bought a car, and rented an apartment. Do we know what uh, the others used the monies for? No, we do not know what specifically they used for. In terms of what has been guarded so far, information only relates to the activities of the two main suspects, and uh, that is uh, Sarah and Patience, who at one point in time, so Sarah was the initial house help, then Patience was the one who replaced her subsequently. So we are told that those are what they know in terms of what they have used their money for. For the other individuals, 
There's no information in that regard. Joseph, what's the status of the trial as we speak? So the, just the initial stages now, uh, the charges have been leveled. A plea was not taken at that particular stage. And so the case will go back to the circuit court where the plea will be taken. And then uh, the court would expect that the prosecutors will comply with uh, disclosures, i.e. making available to the accused persons the evidence they intend to use against them and what they've gathered so far. Then once they get that, uh, the court will fix a date for the trial itself to commence. Mm. What, what could be their fate? Should they be found guilty, Joseph? Uh, these are serious offenses. I mean, for offense uh, like stealing, we are looking at up to uh, 25 years possibly uh, because that is if the judge decides to impose the maximum sentence. The sentence receiving is way lesser than that, but the key issue is the stealing offense which has come at, 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 up against those two individuals especially. Joseph Akablais, legal affairs correspondent with uh, those uh, details of what has happened with uh, the sanitation minister. But another interesting angle to the development is the question about why a minister of state would keep such an amount of money in her house. Where does she get such an amount and why does she not bank it? From the anti-corruption point of view, how does this come across? I've been joined by Vitus Azim, he's an anti-corruption campaigner. Mr. Azim, I believe you've been following this story with keen interest. The question about why such a huge Huge amount of money must be kept at home by no other person than a minister of state. Let me gauge your mood on what has happened. Uh, as, for, as for the question as to why such money is kept in the, in the, in the house, uh, it's obvious. It's, you don't want it to be known. You know, the president said she can pay the day. And so if you go and put it in your bank, maybe one day there will be some investigation and they find out that you are covering this money. And so the best is to put it under your bed. And this was the first time that a worker has stolen money from under the bed of some, some politician. So it's obvious that you don't want it to be, to be made public. So you keep it under your bed. But then it now shows that it is dangerous to put it under your bed. But how does this come across to you that uh, a minister of state uh, is keeping such amount of money in their homes. It, it, it's, very, it's very unfortunate because at a time that the city is depreciating, because we are short of dollars, one person keeps this amount of money in, in the house. We don't know how many Ghanaians, how many politicians, how many business people are hoarding dollars in their houses, pounds and uh, euros. And so definitely it, it is unfortunate and it shouldn't have happened. But you see, it is uh, a way of laundering money. You put it in your house, and then one day you take it and go and buy an asset. And then it becomes a legal asset, I mean, an asset legally acquired. Or even later, you go and put it in the bank and say, oh, this money I sold my property and bought it. So that is the thing. But for now, the only thing we can do is call for an investigation into this matter. And I will talk about three institutions that can investigate this matter. The Office of Special Prosecutor talks about a lifestyle audit. Can they conduct a lifestyle audit on the couple? Number two, the GRA should investigate the source of the funding or the money. And if there's a need to find out whether it is business, whether they're paying taxes, whether it is gifts, whether they're paying taxes, whether it is a, a disposal of assets, whether they are paying tax. And thirdly, for the Commission of Human Rights and Civil Justice to find out, did she declare her assets at the time that she became a minister? And if she declared, did it include these assets and other, I mean, this money and other assets? If not, then she will be called upon to explain how she acquired this money during the time that she was a minister of state. I'm grateful for your time. Vitus Azim is an anti-corruption campaigner. There has been so many reactions coming in on social media. The former president, John Mahama, has tweeted and he said uh, $1 million pl uh, dollars plus 300,000 uh, euros and millions of Ghana cities in the Ghanaian minister's home. Scandalous. Even if I genuinely acquired, why keep millions of hard currency at home? Will Nana Kufuado ever set a good example for the public office holders in his administration? And that's coming from former President John Ramani Mahama.
there's been a lot of comments on social media. I'll share a few with you. Ken Dazzling says they have such money in their homes, yet they went to the IMF. Imagine the amount of money that will be in the homes of Ken Ufuriata, Baumia, and Akofuado. The most painful thing is Gary Sokes will come and defend this. Abu Sadiq says, God protect the house health so they don't get caught. I uh, mean, and Fuseini Abdul says they have taken their eggs, Krasia. May God bless Ghana and protect these two brave Ghanaians. Eben says greedy leaders. And Yao Pebi says sanitation and laundering, uh, money laundering are bedfellows. This begs for serious investigations. Too many. It's a family feud, a political battle between an uncle, Yusuf Osman, and nephew, Manaf Ibrahim, in the NPP parliamentary primary in the Asawase constituency. With the opening of nominations for NPP often constituencies, the thought of an easy race for Manaf, a former contender in the race, has turned to be a rather fierce contest. Others are also joining the race, including Haji Zainab Salo, the Ashanti Regional Financial Secretary of the NPP, who doubles as regional head of Maslock. Nana Ojima puts a spotlight on the Sawase constituency days into the opening of nominations. Asawase has been a safe seat for the National Democratic Congress in the Ashanti region. It is one of the two constituencies in the region never won by the NPP. The closest the party has come to victory in the constituency was in 2016 when they lost to NDC's Muntaka Mubarak by less than 6,000 votes. NPP leaders are optimistic of victory if unity is fostered. Noah Ousu is first vice chair of the Asawase constituency. The party is convinced that when we come out with unity, anything can be achieved. Muntaka isn't a small person when it comes to politics, but we know that gradually, as we fought him previously, we can now you know, come together and then do something positive for ourselves. A staff at the office of the president, Yusuf Osman, is the latest candidate to have picked forms to contest the primary. A Mampurusi from the home of the Sariki Mampurusi of the Zongo community in Kumase, Yusuf is well known among residents of Sabun Zongo. To his supporters, he is a unifying candidate because he is the only one who has refused to align to any faction in the party at the constituency level. Baron Atuguba touts the ability of the aspirant. Happen. We went to 2020 election, lost like 20,000 votes. So if I said, if you continue on doing the same thing, you continue to get the same results. And there's some saying that people do some skirts and blouse in Asawasi constituents. So in case we present the same candidate and the other candidate who thought that people do that underground campaign against him, what would they do? They will go the same way, go and do campaign against him. It won't affect the candidate, but rather go and affect the party at large. So thinking that new face is the person that can unite both fashion. From the household of the Sariki Mampusi also is Manaf Ibrahim, who has long worked towards leading the NPP in the constituency. The former staff of the vice president's office was suspended by the party in 2016, denying him of an opportunity to contest the race after filing nomination. His supporters, who contend his suspension was not justified, say Manaf holds the party's key to success. He's a unifier and he's a philanthropist of this Aswansi constituency and the nation at large. Because not being in a, in, in, in a leadership role as an MC or MP or a parliamentary candidate or whatever, what have you, He's doing so well in the areas of health. As one simple penny for penny for the or be anywhere between your castle brother and all more as one simple penny for where my young and Nimuji said, or bet me a bear MP. Ye one Nimuji dear because of strong young coupon and who more grow any more or brandy who I Meanwhile, the Ashanti regional treasurer of the NPP, Hajia Zainab Salo, has announced her interest to contest. NPP Aswasi primary, the regional Maslok boss expressed concern over lack of unity among party members. Well, if I was to start to my campaign, I would beg them that they should vote for me so that we're able to bring unity among the party. Our intention and our agenda as an MPP is to break the eight. But you can't break the eight without unity. Aswasi MPP, we are more than even NDC. 
It is expected that others will pick nominations in the party's bid to wrestle power from the fifth term incumbent MP, Muntaka Mubarak. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima reporting. Let's stay a while longer on the NPP because Yalbu Abiyan someone, one of the campaign coordinators for Alan Sherman team, says the team is disappointed by the decision taken by the National Executive Committee to decentralize the Super Delegates Congress to prune the presidential aspirants from 10 to 5. He said they expect NEC to put the necessary structures in place to ensure a successful contest. Speaking to Joy News, Yalbu Abiyan says they nonetheless have hope Alan will make it through. And uh, uh, he's been speaking to my colleague, uh, Peter Sen. So, how is the camp, Alan's camp taking all this? We are disappointed, but we have hope and we believe that once the leadership have made this commitment, they will design and implement the decision in a way that will benefit everybody. So, uh, uh, yes, we didn't accept the idea in the first place. And yes, uh, once it's been decided, we have to accept it. But we have a right to be disappointed. But in being disappointed, doesn't mean we've rejected uh, the decision. What, what, what was the wish for the Alan team? No, no, but we don't have to go back to all those uh, <laughs> arguments. You know that it was for a centralized situation. I'm not willing to go back to discuss why and how. I mean, we've gone past that. The decision by the national executive meeting uh, second highest decision making body of the party is binding on all of us is that they will have a regional special delegates conference. The important thing we have to realize is that the real election is still ahead of us in November. This is an administrative process, a mere uh, uh, requirement to reduce the numbers of, of aspirants to a manageable size of five. It is for the party leadership to implement the decision in a way that meets the constitutional threshold in a way that brings credibility to the party's processes because the party needs credibility and trust as we go forward into the general election. Does this affect the campaign of Alan in any way? Absolutely not. The, 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 the special delegates conference, like I said, is an administrative process. It's not the main thing. So <laughs> you, you, you simply pass through, literally, and continue to campaign as we are now. The campaign in Dambai, uh, Krachi, East, and very soon we'll move on to the other regions. Let's go live to my colleague Peter Seno, who is in the Uti region monitoring events for us. Peter, we know that Alan Sherman Ting is wrapping up his campaign in the Uti region. What has, uh, be, what has he been telling the delegates and what has been their response? So he is wrapping up his talk. Currently, we are standing by the regional capital where he is meeting delegates. Uh, his message, as we, we, we may have said, that the paramount of all is to put all party executives on a payroll, uh, get them a pension scheme, and also get two local contractors at a local level when he becomes the president to execute local contracts. And these are the, I mean, the, the, the main pillars of his message that is resonating well with delegates. He also says that he is the only candidate with a national appeal who has the electability. And so delegates should listen to the voices of people who are not even members of the NPP, that they wanted someone who would appeal to the masses of the people. And so that has been his message um, here in the OT region. And so, so far, he's, he's, he's wrapping up his call just to get out of the region, I share. monitoring uh, the NPP's campaign towards the Super Delegates Conference on August 26th. Definitely where to be for all of that is your election headquarters. The bulk oil storage and transportation company says it only has fuel reserve to last four weeks and would have to rely on private sector players if there is a major crisis that cuts external supply into the country. BOSS is mandated to build strategic reserve stocks to meet a minimum 
of six weeks of national consumption in the short and medium term and to increase stock level to 12 weeks in the long term. But the managing director of BOST, Edwin Alfred Provencal, has revealed to joinees that the company has not been able to build a reserve since 2016 due to lack of funds. He spoke to George Riafi on PM Express Business Edition last night. I'm asked, uh, do you have strategic reserves? Uh, what I say is that we have inventory. I don't call that inventory reserves. Where help the uh, Pakujo layman work. Yeah, so I have petroleum I products in my tanks, okay. but they are not called, they are not strategic reserves. Why? Because nobody is paying for strategic reserves. The strategic reserve levy, which is meant solely for strategic reserves, mm -hmm. has been zeroed out since 2006. By who? I don't know. Mm. Uh, the NPA, obviously, got the goods, then government in power, then, mm. I mean... And so nobody is paying for the country to hold strategic reserves. Mm. So what we depend on is uh, the inventory stock, the stocks in tanks that are monitored by NPA to ensure that at least at any particular point in time, uh, we are not running out. Mr. Mr. Professor, that's, I mean, help me for, mm. for the layman again. When, when I think about bust, the first thing that comes to my mind is strategic reserves. Mm. Now, from again your explanation, mm. we don't have strategic reserves; we have inventory. Mm. Again, it comes back to the question about your mandate and whether you or the company. My itself, mandates are three. Are you worried that, as we speak right now, there are aren't strategic reserves because nobody's paying for them? And they are only um, inventory. <laughs> so, uh, this question it has to go to the policymaker, not to me. I'm, I'm running to, a to, business. To convince I'm your running board a business. members who put you there and your shareholders that listen. Uh, we know we don't have we don't have money to buy the strategic reserves. We know that, but we are trying. We, what we do is we make sure we have enough inventory to keep the country running. The nation needs to have a, a certain conversation, and that conversation should lead to how we're going to finance our strategic reserves. It's a very critical information. If you ask me whether does Ghana need uh, strategic reserves, I say yes, Ghana needs strategic reserves. If you ask me whether a for-profit company like Bost should be the one buying, <laughs> going to take a loan from the bank to keep petroleum products for the nation, I would say no. We can't do that because the strategic reserve, like I said, is like an insurance policy and you and I, who benefit from the insurance policy, we need to finance that, that reserve. Mm. How to finance it is a discussion that needs to be had by the policyholder mm. and, and various stakeholders mm. to find a, 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 an optimal way of financing those reserves. Is the Mr. Provencal has called for the conversion of some existing fuel levies to be into strategic reserve levy. Strategic reserve levy, the money that is earmarked to buy strategic reserves has been zeroed out. You think it should be brought back? I think we should find an optimal way of financing the strategic reserve. If the levy is not the optimal way, then we should find an optimal way of mm -hmm. financing the strategic reserve. Mm. I mean, there are, there are other levies that uh, I think um, some of them may have met their uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. Um, we can find a way of converting Sorry, those. Sorry, levy. Yeah, we can find a way of, I don't know, we can, mm. but I know there are some levies that would have met their objectives Life. already. And then some of them could be converted into or could be transferred into a strategic uh, levy or a strategic reserve fund that finances strategic reserves. Mm. With this inventory that you have, yes. God forbid it, the, the war and yeah. everything, we yeah. cannot yeah. import products. Yeah. How long... Would this inventory be able to last? Yeah, with, with gold for oil in place, I think uh, we could go about four weeks, not six weeks. But then there are other products in other petroleum tanks in the country. But these are private? Private, yes. But
Abuipa Authority has contributed to ensuring proper sanitation practices to help curb the outbreak of communicable diseases in Chiaveme in the Ketu North municipality of the Volta region. The power producing company, through its corporate social responsibility, constructed a mechanized borehole and a modern sanitary facility for the community. This is geared towards ending open defecation in the community to help Ghana attain sustainable development goal six. Chiaveme is a farming community located along the Houdeni Road in the Ketunod municipality of the Volta region. Only few households in the community, which has a population of about 1,200, has sanitary facilities, while the only public pit latrine is no more safe for use. Some residents were compelled to use the community basic school's toilet, while majority of them engaged in bad sanitation practices. Chiaveme also lacks access to potable water. Residents rely on water from this dam and the rains. Yeah, we have a very you know poor sanitation conditions over here. At Chiaveme, uh, honestly, we don't have a decent uh, public toilets. The one we have was the old one, the pit latrine, which is almost not usable. So the sanitation condition is very poor. We don't have portable drinking water. We used to drink water from, we have a dam a few miles from here. That is where we drink. Even we have some few boreholes in the, in the community, but they are salty, so we don't normally drink them. So we drink from a dam. Using water from the dam coupled with open defecation contributed to frequent outbreaks of communicable diseases. Even household toilets are not used many. When you go around, only a few houses, out of 10 houses, you only get one household toilet. The screening we did for the vendors this year, the typhoid rate has, has increased in, in these communities because they don't have a place of convenience. Learning of the plight of the community, the Bui Power Authority channeled 650,000 Ghana cities towards the construction of a modern sanitary facility and a mechanized borehole to serve the community. The chief executive officer of Bui Power Authority, Samuel Kofi Jameshi, said his outfit aims to contribute improved sanitation across the country as part of its corporate social responsibility. We are also interested in ensuring sanitation in various areas of this country. And uh, this is not the only place, but of course for Vuta region, this is the first place we've come to. But Bui Power is in Banda, in Savannah region, we are also in the western region where all the three rivers are supposed to be managed by us and also other parts of this country. And we hope that we will continue to do more for the people in order that their social lives will be better than before. The resident of Chiaveme lauded Bui Power Authority for the initiative and promised to ensure proper maintenance of the facility. Fred Kwame Asari. Joy News, Chiaveme. We're still live on Joy News today. We are on, uh, we are in our studios in Kokum Limle, and it's on the final of our streets. Let's take a break. When we return, there's more we'll be bringing to you. Before we take the break, though, there's a call for the issue of terrorism to be seen and dealt with as a societal vice separated from religion. That's according to some Muslim clerics who say with terrorism and violent extremism spreading across Africa at an alarming rate, counter efforts must take into account the socioeconomic drivers of terrorist recruitment aside religion. Listen to international Islamic scholars Sheikh Nurdin Lemon from Nigeria and Sheikh Wa'il Ibrahim from Australia who want much attention to be paid to the negative impact of technology among other things rather than blaming a particular religion for terrorism. Society and of every religion is just how far back into the past you want to go. There's always a time where people use religion to justify taking power and forcing others on their own interpretation. Yep. Every religion has it. Uh, and it comes and it goes. So it's actually, it's unfortunately, it's not new. Um, when you don't know what a good dollar bill looks like, um, it's difficult to identify the fake. 
And sometimes what happens is a society becomes very illiterate about its own religion. That somebody who is charismatic, who touches the grievances of people, can wrap religion and package it in such a way that it looks beautiful. You know, we talk of false prophets, we talk of the wolf in sheep's clothing. We, this is part of what you know, human beings are used to, unfortunately. But what we find is, within the Muslim community, you have those Muslims who have grievances. And what we find also about terrorism uh, and violent extremism is um, ideology alone, without grievance, doesn't produce movement. Yep. What they think they are doing is a liberation theology. But what we find is innocent people being killed in the name of a religion that is teaching peace. And our responsibility as religious leaders is to vaccinate, yeah. if I use that term, mm -hmm. um, the community so that they are not recruited, mm -hmm. they don't support it, yeah. and they can quickly identify it mm -hmm. and you know, call it out for what it is. Mm -hmm. And gradually we find these dying a natural death until mm -hmm. God knows how many years later when mm -hmm. people become ignorant again, then it comes back again, unfortunately. Thank you, Brian. Just to, to answer the question briefly about the Quran yeah. part, because uh, you have to be very clear to, when it comes to those issues. So, yes, mm -hmm. there are verses in the Quran that talks about fighting and killing. We have to be very clear yeah. and educate the, the yeah. masses. Mm -hmm. Because uh, our religion, Islam, is a complete way of life. Yeah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided the believers on how to live in this life yeah. in every aspect of their existence, including when wars you know, are we? Confront us. Yes, so how, how to behave in those ways. Yep. Well, we have rules mm. of how to actually come back with the enemies when they strike. Yep. But those, those verses are often quoted out of context. Yep. Like there is an ayah in the Quran, there is a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to those people in the battlefield at that time mm. and kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. Okay. Now, imagine if you take that verse now and go down the streets of Ghana and start killing non-believers or non-Muslims and start just... But if you continue the ayah, and this, by the way, like a one part of a very long ayah, okay. very long verse. Mm -hmm. And we take a break on Joy News today. We'll be back with business. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Prime, um, the news here on Joy News today with me, Pius Kujobaka. Now, Ghana has not got any strategic petroleum reserves now for crisis moments. This has been confirmed by Managing Director of the Borg Oil Storage and Transportation Company, Edwin Provencal, to join business. But he insists there is no cause for alarm for now. He's been speaking on PM Express Business Edition with George Yaffe. Uh, we know we don't have we don't have money to buy the strategic reserves. We know that, but we are try. We, what we do is we make sure we have enough inventory to keep the country running. The nation needs to have a, a certain conversation, and that conversation should lead to how we are going to finance our strategic reserves. It's a very critical information. If you ask me whether does Ghana need final, uh, strategic reserves, I say yes. Ghana needs strategic reserves. If you ask me whether a for-profit company like Bost should be the one buying, <laughs> going to take a loan from the bank to keep petroleum products for the nation, I would say no. We can't do that because the strategic reserve, like I said, is like an insurance policy. And you and I who benefit from the insurance policy, we need to finance that, that reserve. Mm. How to finance it is a discussion that needs to be had by the policyholder mm. and, and various stakeholders mm. to find a, 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 an optimal way of financing those reserves. Is the bust margin not enough to take care of all these operational costs of yours? No. Bust margin is strictly for maintenance and operations all of the, the network assets. And, and it's... it's I mean, it used to be about 37, 2021, mm. it used to be 37% of our, our, our income. Mm. 2022, it moved to, or 2021 used to be about 47% of our income. 2022, 2021, it got to 37%. 2022, as I speak to you, it's about, 11% of our income. Mm. It's, it's nothing to write home about. 
The Institute of Economic Affairs has indicated that over-reliance on monetary policy in addressing the hikes in inflation would yield no positive results. The Institute is entreating government to address the supply side of factors driving inflation. According to Director of Research at the Institute, Dr. John Kwache, more collaboration is needed between government and the Bank of Ghana to address the country's high inflation in the media budget scheduled for next week. He was speaking at a media interface on Ghana's IMF bailout organized by the Economic Governance Platform. And we rely on uh, a monetary policy framework that um, essentially focuses on controlling demand, demand pressures in the economy. But what we have come to realize is that our inflation is also determined, um, um, you know, to a large extent by supply and cost factors. And this, uh, we've been talking about food, uh, we've been uh, fuel, the importance of fuel in driving our inflation, transportation, and then, then of course, the exchange rate. So you cannot uh, use the Bank of Ghana policy rate alone, you know, to just manage demand. You have to address the supply factors also. And this is what we have been calling for, you know, uh, for, for a long time. And I, we, we just asking both Bank of Ghana and government to, you know, cooperate, work together so, can, so that they can also be addressing the supply and cost factors that uh, drive inflation. Um, we are happy to note that um, when it comes to the demand pressures, um, the, the, the program contains a, a provision for reducing uh, what they call monetary financing of the budget by Bank of Ghana. In fact, government and the Bank of Ghana have signed a memorandum of understanding now uh, for Bank of Ghana not to lend to government at all, uh, you know, under the program. So that will help to reduce uh, the demand pressures. But we're saying that they should do something about the supply and cost factors uh, as well. And that's it for business for now. I am Pius Kojo Bakadara will be at 1 p.m. with the marketplace. <music>
it looks like we we are not getting like what we want to 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 see our time it was it was one code that we we had yeah we had and look at the way we played i can close my eyes and i know where asamwajan is or matthew amwa is and i'll give him the ball but today it looks as if we are not I don't want to use the word confuses, it's too harsh. Uh, we are not getting it. So changing coaches to uh, it distract the, 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 the system of the, the play of the, 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 the team. Black Stars left back, Muntar Kamehene, says that GFA president Kate Okriku is a perfect man to lead the football governor. But he, speaking on Prime Tech, he noted that Kate's decision to share football boost to players shows that he has a bigger plan or vision for development of football. You know, I, I always say that, you know, in this world, whether you do bad, they will talk, whether you do good, they will criticize, everything you do, you know, yeah. and football is all about that. Even for us playing the football, this is how it is. People who criticize you, you know, you understand. But it depends on you how you're going to take it, you understand me. But you don't need to pay more attention to people who, like in your life who criticize you and, you know, you understand. Just try to pick something good out of that. So I think, you know, for him, you know, the, the brain that, you know, he has is, you know, it's more like, it's more than that or it's more what people are talking. You understand me? It's more what people are talking. So, so would you say that those of us or those who criticize Kurt, they don't know the kind of person he's... He is, and the knowledge and the vision he's got for Ghana. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. I can't tell maybe those who criticize them that they don't know. You understand? Because this is what they say, like, you know, this is what they see. And they want to talk about that. You understand me? So if someone criticizes you about something, you know, like, you don't need to tell the person you don't know. Maybe this is what they see. You understand me? So you have to work and to this, prove them wrong. And this is what I'm saying. The brain that he has is more, or he's seen like far beyond maybe what people are talking. You understand? That's your sports for now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. Up next, issue this. Good afternoon, welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News. Now, the CEO of Cruise People Limited, Daniel Vanderpoel, says he initially did not want to get musician Black Sherry arrested for allegedly breaching a contract between them. Speaking to Joy Entertainment, he said that his company had booked Black Sherry for a now cancelled show scheduled for August 19 and made a down payment of $20,000 out of an agreed $40,000 ahead of the event. Hence, uh, when he failed to send an agreed 10 to 15 seconds video advertising his participation, they used every available avenue to reach out to him and his team and for nearly two months got no response. The police would just not wake up and, and arrest Black Sheriff on a baseless or flimsy excuse from, from us. We submitted everything. So based on that, the police secured an arrest warrant. So it was either when he's leaving or he's coming. And so immigration stopped him, handed him over to the police. The police brought him to the police station, gave him the opportunity uh, to, 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 to listen to the complaint. And then the caution statements were read out to him and he wrote his statement. Based on that, he was granted, okay. he was granted a, bill. a bill. What's next from here? <laughs> for us or for him? Uh, for, for the case. Oh, well, for the case, it's simple. Mm -hmm. We have um, uh, a civil suit pending. Uh, we will submit the, the details of that uh, to, actually, he'll, he'll be served, you know, and um, he would look through it and make a response. And if he wants to make ends meet by cutting a deal, get there. If not, then we want to pursue this to this logical conclusion. Because, you see, the way we were treated mm -hmm. is not fair.
Now we are on for showbiz here on Joy News today. There's more showbiz news in our subsequent bulletins. And that'll be all for the news, I guess. Aisha. <laughs> of course, that'll be it for the news. Lady in Black. And for Lady more news, black. log on to myjoyonline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Thank you.